Hello everyone and welcome to Lies, the part of the show that I'd normally uh, use to talk about the mistakes we made and the flags we botched. But as you can probably tell from my scruff and the beautiful decor, I am not exactly at home. I've been on the road for weeks. Uh, I've been stuck in airports forever due to some pilot strikes. So I'm gonna try something different this week uh, because I'm a thousand miles away from where Saray is so we can't do the back and forth that we normally do. I'm gonna answer some of your questions instead. Uh, every month we do a Q&A with the patrons where they basically get to come on something kind of like Skype and ask us questions about the series. And this time there were some amazing questions I really wanted to share with everyone. So I'm actually just gonna answer their questions live here. Uh, so with that, I got my trusty tablet, which I've just almost dropped, and uh, I'm just gonna dive into it. So first question, uh, foreign politics question. Looks like everybody has some allies except Sweden. Is it really so, or is it only an impression and everyone's just piled up to get a cut of the losing side? Um, it, it's sort of true, right? Uh, one of the areas that I feel like Sweden lost the Great Northern War is the diplomatic front. Uh, early on, they were pretty good about being able to keep the sort of Western European powers like France and England out of the conflict. But as things got worse and worse, I mean, yes, everybody did want a part of it. And so you've got initially uh, sort of your Swedish Empire versus uh, Russia, Poland, and Denmark. And Poland's an interesting case even because the Poles didn't totally want to be in it. If you remember that guy Augustus the Strong, there's a whole bunch of weird funny anecdotes about him. Um, like the fact that he would bend horseshoes with his hand, which is why he's known as Augustus the Strong. Um, and when playing a fun Germanic game called Fox Tossing, which is a game which is about you and your partner tossing a fox, and um, hopefully neither you nor the fox like getting horribly mauled by this activity, he would do it with one finger, he would help toss the fox. So he was named Augustus the Strong. But anyway, the important thing is, he was not only king of Poland, he was the elector of Hanover. And one of the areas that was kind of a lie in this is talking about him just as the king of Poland, because he did a lot of this declaring war as the elector of Hanover when the Poles didn't want to and by also being the king of Poland to drag Poland into it. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. There, It does seem like there's a lot, a bigger confederation against Sweden than for Sweden. The three nations were basically the initial confederation and as time goes on, Charles is not a very diplomatic individual. Uh, there have been lots of other requests from Western Europe for him to do things differently or to make peace. When he refuses to, to do this, everyone piles up in the end. So you're correct. Um, it, it actually is that Sweden is sort of isolated in this, and that's one of the major failings. So, question two. Did Sweden have a real shot at emerging the victor in the Great Northern War? If so, what would you say was the biggest turning point where this opportunity was lost? And how do you imagine history would have been different had this happened? So that's actually three questions, uh, each of which I will try and tackle. So first off, did Sweden have a real shot at winning the Great Northern War? Uh, yes, but only if you think about it this way. The Great Northern War didn't have to be the Great Northern War. There was that initial war where it was Sweden versus Poland, Russia, and Denmark, where basically they kicked around everybody, right? And then Charles refused to make peace, right? So there are sort of two wars that go on. That initial war, and then the war that continues when Charles makes the decision to invade Russia. If Charles had been willing to just stop when he had won, I think they could have made substantial territorial gains. And it would have been considered a minor war, which the Swedish Empire, which had been a continuously expanding empire, had again won, and would have sort of continued the trajectory of the Swedish Empire. But, um, unfortunately, by Charles deciding to invade Russia, we get what we now know as the Great Northern War, this much larger, much longer conflict where Sweden gets utterly decimated due to their own hubris. Uh, so, yes, it's possible if you consider, if you think about 
the wars that happened, I mean, not only could they have won, but they did actually win the conflict. Then they went on to keep going. And this is the problem for every great conqueror, right? It doesn't matter if it's Napoleon or Alexander, um, almost every great conqueror we see in history ends up at this moment where they overextend because they don't know their own limits and aren't willing to just stop. Um, so that sort of answers the second question. Uh, what was the biggest turning point here? It's this decision to invade Russia. Uh, if you look at the Swedish Empire at the time, it's a lot of territory, but a lot of that territory doesn't have a lot of people and doesn't have a lot of money. And so what they really needed to do was stop after the initial victories and consolidate their territory, consolidate their new gains, and build up economically before taking on a country as large and as populous as Russia. Uh, so it's really that, that moment where they refuse to make peace, even though a lot of the Western nations are asking to make peace, even though there are peace overtures from Russia. Uh, and then how do I imagine history would be different? That's really hard to say. Uh, it depends on whether or not they're actually able to sort of consolidate economically. And if so, I think you might have seen a united Scandinavia. Instead of having Scandinavia be several countries as it is today, you might have had one uh, larger Scandinavian nation. And in that case, you would have also had Scandinavia continue to play a larger role in the development of Europe over the next few centuries and potentially even all the way to today just by it being a larger, more populous, more economically vibrant entity. Um, because although all those nations, especially today, are very vibrant economically, um, simply by, by pure size, they're not as impactful as one unified Scandinavia might have been. Ooh, this one's a really interesting one. Having done a series on Peter and Catherine the Great, what do you think of the empress who came between them, Elizabeth? So, I think that Elizabeth is a really good uh, sort of example and test case for many of the competent czars and Tsaritsa, Tsarina's um, empresses and emperors in Russia. Elizabeth is herself plenty competent, right? Not quite as impressive as either Peter or Catherine, both who get the title the Great, but definitely a competent ruler. Uh, there is though this issue that sort of plagues Russia continuously. And that's that we see all these like coups and assassination plots and all this dynastic struggle. Which means that almost all the rulers end up being justifiably, but very paranoid. Uh, and this was definitely true of Elizabeth as well as Catherine and Peter. Uh, and in being paranoid, they tend not to turn over a lot of power to their successor, right? Because you give a lot of power to your successor, you give a lot of power to the person who probably has the most at stake or most uh, to gain from overthrowing you. But what does this mean? Well, that may be very smart policy personally, but it's very bad for running a nation because it means that each successor in line is not prepared, does not have a lot of the tools they need, don't have a lot of the connections they need, haven't been doing the job before they're thrown right into it, haven't been working with the people who are essential to running the country. Um, and so a lot of the problems, a lot of the negatives for Catherine's reign to me do fall out of that paranoia that comes from Elizabeth. At the same time, uh, she did a lot to support Catherine at different times. Um, and we see that Catherine has exactly the same issue, right? Catherine does not help her heir. Catherine does not um, really empower her heir to understand how to run the country. And from there on, it's all downhill. Uh, and so I would say that Elizabeth is, is a solid ruler. Elizabeth is a quality ruler but is plagued by the same issues that Russian rulers are plagued with basically up through the end of the Russian Empire. And as such, this inability to prepare the chain of succession uh, creates a lot of the problems that Catherine runs into and that Catherine herself perpetuates.
Uh, you mentioned an experienced corps of the Swedish army many times. What made them so special? Why couldn't Sweden just prepare more of those? Why did these guys sort of disappear? Well, first off, veterans are just that, right? They're veterans, they're hard to come by. They aren't people who are, who are built in a year, right? Uh, to really have a veteran army, it takes an army that has been fighting and winning for years and years. Uh, if you think about the expansion of the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire is basically built off the core of guys who have been fighting and winning the Punic Wars. And you need decades, literally decades and generations to really build a, an army where it's just veterans all the way through, where there's thorough experience, where everyone is uh, of high morale and highly competent and totally stable under fire, ready to go into these dangerous, terrible combat situations without shaking. Uh, so that's one part of it, right? You got this veteran army at the outset of the war who, as just attrition wears them down, as they go through battle after battle and you lose a number of men, you lose these veterans and they have to be replaced with people who have less experience in training. Uh, additionally, on the training front, Charles exploited this thing that, um, was sort of unique to Sweden, this tactic they had. Uh, this is in the period where gunpowder arms have basically become the standard, right? Everybody, every country is using gunpowder weaponry. Uh, and it makes sense, right? We've moved now from the medieval age to the modern age. But uh, gunpowder weaponry isn't so advanced that it's going to instantly decimate any army, like the, like World War One gunpowder weaponry, right? It is, um, it's still a little slow, it's still a little clunky, and Peter's army has this sort of special technique they use, which involves doing what he does so often. It's why he's so aggressive, because their technique is to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They realize that if they can have a gunpowder army like the other gunpowder armies that uh, is highly trained, highly disciplined, good fire, uh, good fire discipline, good firepower, but that they can get one volley off and then charge in after the opponent has fired their first volley between that shot and like the time it takes them to reload. Once they get to hand-to-hand, -hand, because they're really trained in hand-to-hand, -hand, they can just totally destroy these other armies. And since we've moved to a gunpowder system, nobody's wearing heavy armor anymore, right? Nobody's wearing all the defensive stuff we had invented to prevent hand-to-hand -hand combat. So it's an interesting turning point in history and nobody's really uh, maintaining a lot of like pikemen any longer like the old pike and shot system because we're not worried about cavalry charges and since it's all gunpowder they realized that they could exploit that in some ways by engaging hand to hand. That also takes training that's very hard thing to do to run into basically a bunch of guys shooting at you and so that takes veteran troops who are not going to shake at that. Um, and then finally we talked a little bit about uh, the Swedish Empire not being that economically strong. And so it's kind of like Civ or like a total war game when you build up a big army but it's draining your whole treasury. They couldn't afford to instantly rebuild that army, right? Once it was lost, they had spent so much on it and it had been draining them for so long that without, especially without further spoils of war, they couldn't just turn around and hire that many men again, especially since they were from less populous parts of Europe. Here's a suggestion, Parallel History, Extra History Edition. Wow. A series where you folks compare and contrast historical figures from same or similar eras like Catherine the Great or Suleiman the Magnificent. And I think this is actually awesome. This is something I totally think about doing if you guys ever want to suggest it on, uh, on the patron suggestions. Um, because it really comes from where the core of extra history itself comes from, which is Plutarch. Uh, when looking at history, there's a lot of different ways to approach uh, thinking about history and delivering history. And one of those ways is about facts and dates and numbers, right? And uh, just the pure what went on. Another way is this way that I actually have a lot of respect for, but which is not an our thing. This is real historians who are going and digging out the minutia so we have all the details, right? Who are making sure that we know 
uh, all the bit part players who we making sure that we have the history of that small monastery somewhere out in the hinterlands of France, that sort of thing. And then there's this idea that I feel like really comes from Plutarch. Plutarch was this guy who sort of is the father of biography and he wrote this book called The Parallel Lives of Greeks and Romans, often known as Plutarch's Lives, where he would take a famous leader and another famous leader and he would write a biography of one and then a biography of the other and juxtapose them so that way you had to sort of think about the two and how they related to each other and think about both the positive and negative aspects of each and what we can learn from them and how their lives and the difference between their lives can inform how we see the world today and how we live our own lives. And that to me is something that I really, I believe in with history. I believe that history's job is to serve as a lens for us to think about um, the things that are going on for us today. And so would I do a, a parallel history sort of extra history episode? Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I might even be willing to do a commentary episode as a one-off where when we do some of these, like Justinian Suleiman or something, if we have some spare space, we can talk about the differences and the similarities and what it means. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, oh, along those lines, would you do an episode about a king in Southeastern Asia? Uh, sure, anything that you guys suggest as patrons um, is something that we'd be very, very happy to do. So hopefully, yeah, come in, submit that, and if not, jump on the patron Q&A at the end of the month, and I'm happy to talk about any of these kings, and I'd love to hear about some of them, because there's probably some that you know a lot more about than I do. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, since you did the development of writing, could you do similar ideas like the development of medicine in the ancient world, and food, like which foods were available and how they were cooked? Uh, and I know this is straying a little bit, but this is the sort of question that we get a lot in the comment stream. So, yes, one, if you guys vote for it, absolutely. And two, uh, this history of writing episodes sort of come from an interest of mine. Because they were one-offs, they're the things that I get to just choose to run and do. Uh, I had a lot of knowledge about the history of writing because it's just a topic that I've read about, that I'm interested in, that I kind of find fascinating because I feel like it really changed the world. Um, these are topics that obviously change the world as well, but I don't know very much about ancient medicine. I have a pretty good sense of the history of medicine from the beginning of the era of modern medicine, but ancient medicine I'd love to learn about. I, I don't know enough yet. Uh, and the same with food. I know something about the history of agriculture, but I really don't know much about the history of cooking or food, so I would just have to study those. But you've given me something interesting to go look into, so there's, there's that. Um, there's one more off-topic one, but I think is really good. So it's pretty clear by now that you guys want to do a series on the Seven Years of War. All I'm going to add is when you do, be sure to save a video for the War of Austrian Succession. And for any of you guys who know, the Seven Years War is really what I would consider to be the first truly world war, the first global war. And I think there's a group of these wars as we're sort of entering the modern era, right, in the 18th and 19th century, that lead us very directly to World War I, which in my opinion influences and uh, really sort of gives us a path towards almost everything that's going on today. And yet we very rarely look at some of these, these earlier conflicts and how they played out across the globe and how they changed life all around the globe. Um, and so yes, I would love eventually, it would be amazing if we did this for a bunch more years, to do the War of Austrian Succession, the Seven Years War, all these sort of things, the War of Spanish Succession, uh, where once we've had them, once we've done them all, we could put together a video playlist and um, show this progress, that this conflict that kept happening while we were trying to figure out what is the modern world and while everyone was jockeying for, for, for position as we were exiting sort of, at least for Europe, the feudal world and entering the, our present day, very different sort of society. Uh, oh, which is perfect because it gives me a good segue. I don't know if I can cover it in lies, Guess I can, but can you give us an idea of how Charles could have affected the War of the Spanish Succession? So there was this point in 
all of this, which as I mentioned early on, uh, Charles was not the most diplomatic of fellows. And the Western European powers asked him to become the arbiter of the Spanish succession because again, uh, the Spanish king didn't really have an heir, there were lots of claimants to it, uh, there are options for lots of different countries to, to take this over, so everybody's gonna come into conflict over it. One of the things that very much could have happened is Charles as a neutral arbiter, they sort of asked him to come in because he's got this really powerful country that at least if you look at Sweden at the time, right, for, for generations now, for a couple of kingships, they've been on the rise, they've been growing, they've got a super powerful army. Nobody really is seeing the cracks in the Swedish system, the economic weakness, uh, the population weakness. Um, and so they asked him to come in and, and become the arbiter of this. I think we might even be able to avoid the war because to everyone at the time, whoever's scales he puts his fingers on, they're if he was to come in on anybody's side, that's who's winning that war. Um, and in doing so, I think he could have made powerful allies in Western Europe and prevented some of what happens later where all of Western Europe gangs up against him, uh, along with basically all the rest of Europe. Um, and so I do think that Charles had this moment where he could have become the arbiter of sort of diplomacy in Europe. And had he chosen that, rather than to attack the Russians. I think this whole thing, and I think Swedish power in general, plays out very differently, at least over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, oh, and this is a good one to end on. So how terrible exactly was Charles's wound? Uh, I'm not sure which wound you're talking about. If you're talking about his foot wound, it was really gross. Like, a, the shot went straight through his foot and like ended up embedded by his toe and he still was moving around, right? And so every description I've gotten out of it was super gross. Uh, but he did survive it and he did, uh, he was back walking, he wasn't permanently crippled. He probably would have limped, but, um, but he wasn't permanently crippled by it. He continued to try and lead his army. Um, if you're talking about his final wound, his, his shot to the head, um, this one, there's a ton of conspiracy theories around. I didn't really put them into the show because one, I felt like it would break the flow, and two, they've exhumed Charles like four times, three or four times now. And they did it once at the beginning of what we'd consider um, modern forensics, right? And so they pretty much debunked all the, um, all the conspiracy theories. And if you want to see a really gnarly picture of Charles's wound, on Wikipedia there is a picture of the exit wound for his head, and I mean it's pretty massive. But the reason I bring that up is because Forensic says that this had to be a shot going at high speed, basically fired down from some of the defensive works uh, on, on the other side. Um, there's these whole wild conspiracy theories about that it was one of his own army, one of his own soldiers who shot him. There was nobody around him really at the time, at least none of the commanders, none of the like notable people, so no one saw the shot. So everyone thought it came from the, from the opposing side, but especially as the empire crumbled and Charles gets, in, rightly in a lot of ways, blamed for a lot of things because it is his arrogance and his hubris that causes all this collapse and caused all this harm in the first place. Uh, people say things like, weirdly, that um, one of his own soldiers shot a button, like a button from his uniform at Charles and killed him. Uh, there's some other conspiracy theories about uh, very clandestine plots, but uh, it is a, a very large head wound that, as far as my understanding goes, from everything that I've read, uh, when exhumed and looked at through relatively modern forensic techniques, it's almost certain that he was not shot by his own side and that he was in fact killed by a random bullet from, from the opposing defensive works. Uh, so with that, I am going to go and take a few minutes 
uh, to, to gather myself and find some peace before I have to rush off to my next thing uh, because I am traveling overseas again. Uh, but I hope you all enjoyed getting to hear a few of your fellow Extra History viewers' questions, and I hope that answered some of your questions. And I would love to see everybody on the Q&A in the next month. Uh, other than that, I'm pretty sure that soon the Kiner's music for this, which is great, will be posted. And um, following this one, we are doing a series, I think on Bismarck. I might be wrong on that. I apologize if I'm wrong on that. But if not, Bismarck's coming, which is an important thing because Bismarck is one that I've been waiting for since we started Extra History. But I'm rambling at this point because I am exhausted, so I'm gonna jet, but it's, these are always a blast, and I would love to talk to more of you guys. You guys always ask amazing questions, and there are always amazing comments, and I learn a ton, and am forced to think about a lot of things that I may not have considered just because of the questions you guys ask, so keep asking them, uh, and I will see you all in a week. Take care, everybody. Thank you.